Last Sunday, we finished up our study of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And one of the things that we did a deep dive into with a visualization was uh, this idea that the Bible says that becoming a Christian is a choice that each of us has to make. But the Bible also seems to say that it's a choice that God makes as well. And so we have these two seemingly opposing concepts. Both of them are in the Bible. Both of them are absolutely true. So if you haven't seen Sunday's message yet, I'd suggest you watch that first. I hope that it uh, helps to demystify this often confusing concept. Now, today's midweek message covers a couple of the finer points that we didn't have time for on Sunday. We worked through the general concept a few days ago, uh, but today I want to go back through a couple of exceptions to the rules that we talked about, or maybe they're not exceptions, but points of clarification at least that are really important for us if we're going to understand exactly how it is that God works with us uh, in our lives. So to start with, let's go back to Romans chapter 8 verse 28. And that says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. So we've been talking a lot about this verse, but mostly we've been looking at the first part of it up till now. We've been looking at the part that shows that God is poking us and prodding us and he's poking and prodding those around us so that these things all come together and we wind up uh, taking the right path in our own tree of decisions. And this verse also assures us that this path that God prompts us and prods us to take is one that is good for us. And so that's why this is one of the most comforting verses of the Bible, because it tells us that whatever is going on in our lives, it's for our own good, even if it feels bad at the time. And of course, uh, this was one of our big points from last Sunday. But we have to make sure we don't miss this second part of it as well. The promise of Romans 8.28 is only for believers. God only promises to the work to work for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. We have to understand here Romans 8:28 does not apply to non-Christians. This is very clear though. God is still at work in everyone's personal decision trees, but the Bible doesn't promise that this work is for the benefit of everyone on earth. It's only for the benefit of his children. Now, God's still going to use everybody else to ultimately glorify him and accomplish his plans, but that won't be for the good of all people involved. Now, just in case this seems cruel to you or unfair or whatever, remember this lesson that we've come back to a few times in the past couple of weeks now. We already established that God knows everyone who would decide to follow him, and so he makes sure that all of those people do. Remember, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So if we put these two things together, Romans 8, 28 and John 3, 16, we see that God wants to work for the good of everyone, but he knows that most people will never cooperate with him. They rejected what God has done for them and wants to do with them. So we wind up with this very large group of people who God knows will ultimately reject him to the grave. And even though these people have chosen to reject him, that doesn't mean that God doesn't still use them to still accomplish his plans. Consider Proverbs chapter 16, verse 4. It's kind of the antithesis of Romans 8, 28. It says, the Lord works out everything to its proper end, even the wicked for a day of disaster. Essentially, the Bible tells us we're going to accomplish God's plan one way or another. We can either do it the easy way or we can do it the hard way. Remember the story of Joseph. His brothers sold him into slavery and he runs into them later. And what did he tell them? Genesis chapter 50 verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Now, there was reconciliation in that particular story, but there didn't have to be for God to have used the actions of evil people to push Joseph through the various decision points in his life. And like Joseph, God will use sinful people and sinful actions to help navigate you through your decision tree as well. And in light of this, we have to understand 
God does not cause bad people to sin, but he does know the decisions that they make and how those decisions will affect the outcomes of others. So he doesn't cause them to sin, but he can prod them here and poke them there the same way he does for the rest of us. He can cause a dog to bark. He can cause a storm to come. He can remind a group of people of a powerful feeling of jealousy, knowing Joseph's brothers would freely choose the sinful decision. And that would be the very thing that Joseph would need to move him in the right direction. So this was our first point here. God is at work in everyone's individual decision trees, but he only promises that it's for the good of his children. And the second thing is, as a Christian, even though we're uh, under God's guiding hand, he's working for our good, he's helping us navigate our decision tree, we still have an element of free will. And as such, we are still able to make some bad decisions. Well, why exactly is that? If God is prompting us and guiding us, why can we still mess things up? And the answer is, as we're making free will decisions, sometimes we don't get it right. Sometimes we rebel, sometimes we make mistakes or just don't understand how God is prompting us. Now, I don't think we can mess up salvation. There's enough scriptural evidence that shows us that anyone who could come to a place of salvation, God makes sure that they do. And the Bible says he holds on to that and takes care of that salvation for us. But we're still responsible for leading godly lives after that salvation takes place. That's a thing for us to do. So here's what this looks like. Let's take a small snapshot of your decision tree. We'll isolate a single branching decision. Let's say somebody from your work calls you up and they say, man, did you hear what Bill did today? And then they start to unload some gossip on you. And while that's happening, the Holy Spirit is prompting you. On one hand, you wanna hear him out and you maybe wanna pile on a little bit. That's what you wanna do. But you can feel this little pinprick in the back of your mind. That's the Holy Spirit saying, hey man, hey, hey, hey you. No, that's gossip, that's sin. Remember Ephesians 4.29. You need to gently correct this person. At this point, you are at a decision point. You have a choice to do the right thing and ask that person to maybe not have that conversation with you. That would be the biblical thing to do. But you also have the option of doing the wrong thing. You can sin. You have the power to do that. You have free will. You can provoke that conversation to go further. Yeah, I can't believe Bill said that. And guess what Sheila did because of that? You won't believe it. Now, that's what you want to do in our example. It's wrong, but that's what you want to do. So you're a Christian. Romans 8.28 is in full effect. And as we've already said, God is working in your conscience right then to get you to do the right thing. But your sin nature is at war with that, trying to get you to do the wrong thing. Here's how we classify this. We would say the decision that God wants you to make, that's God's perfect will. It's God's perfect will that we don't engage in this sinful conversation. But we're not automatons, right? We're not bound to follow God's perfect will. We're supposed to, we should, but we have free will so we can do what we want. So in our example here, if we decide to gossip anyway, then we say we are acting in God's permissive will. It's not what he would normally want for us, but he allows us to make our own decisions even when it's not the right one. And this whole concept is part of why the Lord's Prayer says what it says. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That part of the prayer is saying, I may want these things up here, the wrong things, but what I want more than anything is for your perfect will to be done. Please help me to make the right decisions to make that happen. We have that freedom. We have the freedom to do the right thing. We have the freedom to do the wrong thing. And that freedom does not negate Romans 8.28. It actually works with it. In all things, when God is working for our, our good, that can happen even if we choose to do the wrong thing. And presumably, when we, if we had done the right thing, God would be setting us up to do the next thing, right? That would be the next step on our decision tree. But since we've decided to go up top and do the wrong thing instead, Romans 8.28, still in effect, God is going to work for our own good, 
even up here when we're doing the wrong thing. And as such, he's going to work hard to push us to get us back on the right track. And that may be through a painful experience of God's discipline. That's for our own good. It might hurt. But if that pushes us back into God's perfect will, then that's about as good as anything that can be done for us. That's Romans 8, 28 in action. God's perfect providence, our free will, and it all fits together perfectly, even when we rebel. Well, those are our two finer points that we didn't have time for on Sunday. I hope this has been helpful. I hope it's been interesting. And until next time, Lord willing, there is a next time. May God bless you and your family.